finding our hope in scripture. That's going to be the theme of our of our retreat. And tonight we start our first session finding our hope with Abraham. And we'll start this session turning to the Lord in prayer by asking for the Holy Spirit to be with us. So I'm I'm going to start this retreat in silence, asking you to be silenced just for a few moments as we gather ourselves in the presence of the Lord, as we remember that he is with us much more than we are with him and he's with us always. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to come in silence. As the deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you. From the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. So this psalm is all about hope, but it's all about reality as well, experiencing the reality of being, feeling away from God and out of sync with, with what should be. So now let's look at Abraham and how that fits with him. Now we know that Abraham was the friend of God, he's called the friend of God, isn't he? And here he is, the first man really that is recorded to, to be the friend of God and to have this extraordinary intimacy with God from the beginning. So we're in Genesis 12. And in Genesis 12, it starts abruptly, although we had the genealogy of Abraham, the son of Terah, just before in, in 11, in the few verses before that. 
Here it starts really abruptly from verse one. Now the Lord said to Abram, go out from your country. And then you have a whole list of promises. Everything that the Lord is going to do for Abram. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will exemplify divine blessing. I will bless those who bless you and so on and so forth. Everything the Lord wants to do for Abram at this point. And of Abram, we, we know not really what he feels about it, how he experiences this encounter, but we know what he does. So Abram left just as the Lord had told him to do. And really what characterizes Abraham oh, is his obedience, which begins here in chapter 12 and will carry on throughout his life, his absolute obedience, which to us can look sometimes completely incomprehensible. And so um, we will see how, first of all, this First call of Abram, chapter 12 in Genesis, is one of many, many. God is relentless, absolutely relentless in basically wanting to bless Abram, who becomes Abraham very quickly. So we have the famous star counting, Genesis 15, 4 to 6. Now, God has said in, in 12, you know, I will make you a great nation. Abraham, as you know, was 75, no children. So he thought, well, my servant Eliezer will be my heir and, and I will give him everything and that will happen like that. And in Genesis 15, God says, no, it will be from your flesh and blood. And so, all right. And, and that's when, you know, you have the, the stars and you have that first strange covenant with the animals. Okay, so God really tries to spell out to Abraham, no, this is what going, this, is a promise, it's for you, it's going to be your flesh and blood, you're going to be a father, right? So then there's the whole business with Ishmael, isn't it? If it's my flesh and blood, but my, my wife can't have children, she's barren and she's old, so, you know, let's, so there's the whole setup with Hagar. But no, in Genesis 17, 1 to 22, no, it's not Ishmael, it's going to be Sarah's son. It's gonna be Sarah's son. Now, Genesis 17 is also the gift of the covenant with the circumcision. And so every time there's a deeper sort of covenant and every time there's a, a more specified promise, a more specific promise. So no, it's not going to be Ishmael, even though Ishmael is your blood and flesh and blood. It's going to be the son of Sarah. And in Genesis 17, which I encourage you to, to look at later, Abraham laughs. Because I'm gonna, am I going to have a son that's 100 years old? And, and Sarah is 90 years old. How is this going to be possible? And he laughs, but not in disbelief, in happiness that the Lord would do such a thing. And then in Genesis 18, a famous, famous passage of the encounter at the Oak of Mamre, the three mysterious visitors who are one. So is it God with two angels or is it the, the God himself, three and one? We don't know. But this very, very mysterious passage of God's visit, the Lord visits Abraham and Abraham receives God. It's the hospitality of Abraham. He actually gives those three angels, men, um, a, a lavish hospitality in his tent. And that's when they say, when we come back next year at this time, your wife uh, will have a son. And, and here, whereas in Genesis 17, we had the laughter of, of Abraham. In Genesis 18, we have the laughter of Sarah. And, and, and Isaac means laughter. So the son is finally given. The son is finally born in Genesis 21. By that time, Abraham is 100. So between Genesis 12, which was our first, the, the first promise given, and Genesis 21, 25 years have passed of waiting for a promise and of 
hopes being built up in Abraham for that promise which he never ever expected, never dreamed of, probably at the age of 75, was completely reconciled, it would never happen. And now God is speaking continually, promising this extraordinary miracle and finally making it happen in Genesis 21. And so we can see that in all of that, and here we have the visitors in Genesis 18, the three visitors who are having a good time lying around eating that meal with the, with the, uh, the calf that has been slaughtered and Abraham here and Sarah. Um, we can see that all of this, absolutely every bit of it was God's initiative. It's not something Abraham came up with. His initiative in every way. It's his idea. It was never Abraham's idea to leave his country. It was never his idea to that he should have a son. It was not his plan. And it's also completely entirely God's doing because it's completely and entirely miraculous. This extraordinary gift of a son to a man who is a hundred year old. And every time just Abraham obeys and says yes, and yes, and yes. And so we can see the hope of Abraham building up to being completely realized in his son, the miracle son, the son that should never have been, and is a pure gift, the idea of God, the initiative of God given to him, a gift that he never, ever expected. And so we have Abraham who has, here is with, with Isaac, this is um, an etching by Rembrandt. So Abraham believes God's promises for the future every time, which is very hard to do for 25 years, not seeing a thing about it. Uh, so it's not like this first half of Abraham's life is actually easy. It wasn't. He believed everything God said, even though he did not see much of it until 25 years later. And then he not only believes, but he acts on these promises. He acts on these promises. Um, so that it's not just a notion. It's so much of a reality for him that uh, he acts on them. And then finally, we see that he hopes. He hopes because God is faithful and God has finally, after 25 years, fulfilled that hope. So this is where we, we look at hope. Now, I want to have this first uh, sort of um, pondering of hope in that context of hope having an object. And that object would be Isaac for, for Abraham. And it's a hope that, I hope that. And the hope that, when we say I hope that, or we hope that, but usually it's about me, it's about my hope. And hope is a, an extremely personal thing. It's not something we share. Uh, it has to do with my own desire, my own understanding, but my own desire of what I want, what I believe is possible for me. And this is good and fitting because we're human, we're alive. And so I hope that in the future, there'll be lots of good things. And, and each one of us at this point, we can reflect, you know, Abraham had this whole hope given to him as if from outside, because at 75, having had a barren wife, he probably never hoped that he would have a son. But that hope that he would have a son has been built into him by God himself over 25 years until it's realized. He hopes that. Now, if we turn back to ourselves, and when I say I hope that, 
each one of us, no matter what circumstances we're in, no matter what has happened to us before, uh, and not knowing what will happen to us after, all of us can say, I hope that, and have some object to fill it with, if you want. Uh, each one of us can um, fill, the, <laughs> fill the gap. Um, and perhaps this is an exercise that we could do with the Lord. Looking at what we hope that. And that has to do with the future. But also perhaps looking about looking at what we had hoped that. That may have happened or not have happened. But as human, hope is so much part of our life. It's sort of built in us. Why? Because the promises of God are actually built in us. The promises of God are built within us from the moment we're born. The hope is there. A hope for life. And a hope not just for life, but a hope for happiness. A hope for flourishing. I hope as well to make a difference. I hope to, to succeed and not necessarily, you know, as a being on top of, it, of others, but to succeed as a human life, as a human flourishing, to, to be the best and to do the best that we can, to make a difference. And it's a hope for love as well, for hu human relationship, for friendship, but also for family, a hope to build together something beautiful, a hope that is inscribed in every task and project that we un un undergo and, and un undertake, because we can never be begin something without hope. And imagine every single thing we begin each day, beginning with um, getting out of bed. You know, the French poet Charles Peggy had a wonderful saying about that hope that gets out of bed he said you know faith builds cathedral and charity builds hospitals and hope gets out of bed so with that hope you don't even go anywhere near any project small as it is because without hope we don't even begin but it's the hope that i hope that it will not rain, I hope it will turn all right, I hope that we will be happy. And so it can be great hopes, little hopes, but the hope that. And perhaps we, we also have this hope that in our understanding of religion, in our own relationship with, with God, in, you know, I hope that by going to church, something will get right in my life. And this, these are good hopes. These are all absolutely good and they're inbuilt in us. We even have that hope that in our very personal relationship with the Lord. In, in, you know, we bring that hope in every prayer that we make. I hope that that person will be all right. I hope that my friend will get healed. I hope that um, my dad will find a job. I hope that my son will... Um, sort himself. I hope that my daughter will find a husband. I don't know. But all these hopes that we bring with us in prayer, every prayer of intercession is a prayer of hope. And it's a prayer of hope that, because it's a, there's a particular object to our petition. And finally, this hope is for, is for communion, is for being alive together and for a life that endures and is fruitful and is just and serene and happy so all the good things we can only hope for the good and we can only hope for the good that's not yet there because if it's already there we don't hope for it anymore we just enjoy it so it has to be a future good that we hope for i hope that now everything that we hope that we need to perhaps consider and, and treasure. And again, this is an invitation tonight, perhaps to bring it to the Lord in prayer. Everything that I've hoped 
that would happen. That may or may not have happened, but everything that I hope that will happen now, I bring to the Lord. So let's go back to Abraham. Because in chapter 22, suddenly, sometimes after these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him up there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will indicate to you. And that's where in the midst of all the hopes comes the incomprehensible. It's as if God has changed his mind. Things don't make sense. Everything that we had hoped for, the hope that, as find here a complete closure, it seems, when God asks Abraham to sacrifice the son of the promise. The, the, the very son, the boy on, on whom all the hopes were focused. And what's very mysterious about this is that we actually don't know what Abraham thought about it. We know only what he did about it. He obeyed. So early in the morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took two of his young servants with him, along with his son Isaac. When he had cut the wood for the burnt offering, he started out for the place God had spoken to him about. On the third day. So imagine the time between the moment that God speaks and the moment of sacrifice takes days. And during all that time, we still don't know what Abraham feels. We only know what he does. On the third day, that intense time of complete obscurity, because it seems God has said one thing and carried out one plan, and now he's changing completely his plan. That's how we understand it here in our, in our perspective. So on the third day, Abraham caught sight of the place in the distance. So he said to his servants, you two stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go up there. We will worship and then return to you. So that's in Genesis 22, the chapter after the birth of Isaac. And then Abraham carries on. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, put it on his son Isaac. Then he took the fire and the knife in his hand. And the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, what is it, my son, he replied. Here is the fire and the wood, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham replied. The two of them continued on together. Now, this is very interesting because in all of these days of anguish, this is the only sentence that Abraham says. What is it, my son? And then God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. And what do this, what does it say to you about to us about the, 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 the disposition of Abraham? Well, it speaks to us about an extraordinary trust. God will provide for himself the lamb. Now, of course, at this point, Abraham must have thought, well, the lamb is Isaac. I'm not going to tell him he's the lamb. So he found a roundabout way. But there's still, 
implicit in that sentence a trust that God knows what he's doing. There is no resistance. There is, you know, the, the human instinct would just run away from a God who asks such a thing. There is no resistance in Abraham. There is extraordinary and almost incomprehensible trust. Now, Abraham goes on to the very end. When they came to the place God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood on it. Next, he tied up his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife, and prepared to slaughter his son. Up till now, all we had was that sentence from Abraham. We had nothing else. God will provide for himself the lamb. Now, we know that the way that Abraham understands that sentence now is very clear because he he really does mean to slaughter his son, because this is what God is asking of him. And this is one of the most difficult passages in the whole of scripture. It's one that's coming next Sunday in the first reading. It is, to, to us, it sounds horrific. But really, how do we know what went on in Abraham? We don't. The text doesn't tell us. The text only tells us what Abraham does. The text doesn't tell us what Abraham feels. But so we can, you know, discuss, interpret whatever we think about Abraham. But there's a place where we can go um, to find out whether, to find out an answer to that question, which is, did Abraham abandon his hope? Did Abraham completely give up on his hope that had been built in him for 25 years, that he would have a son and that out of his son, his descendants would be as many as the stars of heaven? Is that gone? Is that forgotten? Is that over? Is that an arbitrary God who goes from plan A to plan B without any rational uh, comprehension behind it, to any coherence, completely arbitrary? completely absurd and all he asks of us this absurd god is a blind obedience to do whatever he wants no matter how little sense it makes no matter how little how much suffering it causes and this is a way to interpret this um, but is it the right way in other words did abraham abandon his hope and there's a passage in scripture so that's you know, sort of authoritative in a way that we can look at scripture to interpret scripture. Because there's a passage in the New Testament that sort of gives us an insight of what Abraham thought and whether he did or did not abandon his hope. And here it is. Um, first of all, well, it's in Hebrew, Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, a very mysterious and interesting passage. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He had received the promises, yet he was ready to offer up his only son. God had told him, through Isaac, descendants will carry on your name. And he reasoned that God could even raise him from the dead. And in a sense, he received him back from there. So that's a text that tells us what Abraham thought about the situation. Again, we knew only what Abraham did, but we didn't know what he thought. And here it says that it tells us Abraham reasoned that God could even raise him from the dead. In other words, Hebrews is telling us, no, Abraham did not abandon his hope at all. He hoped even more because the hope that, which is usually enclosed within the realm of human possibilities, within our little reality that we you know, understand for ourselves, Abraham placed it within a much greater 
reality within a much greater possibility, God's own possibility. God had given him a complete miracle with Isaac. And God could give him another complete miracle by raising Isaac from the dead. There is no closure on hope. There is no way, no place, no moment at which we can say that's it, there is no hope. For Abraham, if we go with the understanding of Hebrews here, that is expressed by the letter to the Hebrews, for Abraham, there is no such thing as a definite end to hope. The hope that, for him, is placed within a much greater context than the context of human realization and human possibilities. Of course, with some help from God, but within what is actually possible, what has been known to be possible. For him, that hope that is placed within the context of a hope in, the hope in God, which is to some extent a lot scarier than the hope that, because it's a lot more unknown. And so with Paul, we can see that Abraham hopes against hope. Now, Paul in Romans 4, 18 doesn't use this sentence about Abraham, about the sacrifice of Isaac. He uses it about the birth of Isaac, the conception of Isaac. Um, but it's the same attitude. What is impossible to human persons, what is impossible within the, the you know, a, a sort of a narrow horizontal perspective on reality is absolutely not impossible to God. And so there is no boundary to hope. Now that doesn't mean that things will turn out as we want them to, but it means that we can hope in and that every hope that, that we have, that we bear within ourselves, that we desire, should be placed within the context of hoping in God. And that hoping in is left to God. And so to some extent, when we hope, we don't know. We never know what will happen. We can't plan, we can't expect. And to some extent, to hope is to be constantly surprised. And to stop hoping is to shut ourselves completely from the surprises that God wants to give us. To shut our reality so that God is not part of it. So that it's to some extent much more comfortable to know what can be done and what can't be done. But that's not actually the reality in which we're invited to step in, which is the reality of trusting in God. In a context that is profoundly difficult and sometimes profoundly disturbing, sometimes profoundly incoherent, and sometimes profoundly in contradiction with what we already know and believe of God. So we're invited to hope in, to be able to say, I know it's not going well, but I hope in God. I know not of my prayers are much answered, but I hope in God. When it looks like there is no possibilities for human capacity to get out of a situation, when I've plunged myself, say, in sin, or when I am completely helpless with illness and facing death, when I am utterly crushed by the weight of the sorrows of the world, I can hope in God because God provides always an opening into a greater reality into a greater context, which is not just a context that I can experience physically, humanly,
but is the context of his love, which will require of me greater faith, greater hope, greater love. A context in which a lamb appears and becomes providentially the one who enters into that context, that very context that I can't cope with, carries the wood and becomes my reason to hope. I hope in. I hope in God. That doesn't mean I know how it's going to turn out. I have no idea. That doesn't mean that everything will be wonderful. Probably not. I don't know. But it means that I'm not closing reality to, uh, to God coming in and turning things around, which is exactly what happens in chapter 22 when we hear that as Abraham was um, raising his arm to, to slaughter his son, suddenly the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Do not harm the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God because you did not withhold your son, your only son from me. Abraham didn't do this in fear of God. He did it out of trust that God could even take this and do something out of this. But now God is absolutely manifesting his will that this is not what he wants. But on the contrary, he provides then the ram caught up in the, in, in the, in the bushes to be the sacrifice on the mountain the Lord provides. Of course, that ram is an image of the Lamb of God who will be uh, given, offered. So the son of Abraham is spared, but the son of God is offered, if you want. And that's the first, um, traditionally, it's understood to be um, the first image, if you want, one of the first image uh, of, of, of the coming of the Lord who offers himself a sacrifice, how to understand this, this extraordinary gift of God who, for sparing us, does not spare in his own son. And so in the sacrifice of Abraham, we find that God does many things. What does God do? He tests Abraham's faith and purifies his hope. He opens up his hope to something much, much bigger even in the midst of the absolute horror that Abraham must have experienced in those days of walking up the mountain with his son. But this trust, this trust that he must have had, the trust that we are all called to have in the midst of the horrors of our life. No one is spared, but that trust is for us to, to get hold of and, and to live. God manifests definitely that he does not want human sacrifice. He does not want Abraham. He says it. He sends his angel. It couldn't be clearer. This is not how to worship God. In case there was any sort of uh, ambiguity about that in comparison with the other religions that were around. He announces his own son to be sacrificed as the lamb that he will provide for all. And he provides everything he has promised, everything that Abraham had hoped for. Because in Genesis 22, the hope that, that we had started with is not canceled. Is not canceled, that hope that is still valid. But it now takes a much greater meaning. And so God repeats his first promise to Abraham. I solemnly swear by my own name, because you have done this. And have not withheld your son, your only son. I will indeed bless you. And I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be as countless as the stars of the sky. Again, this is this repetition. The promise is the same. Your descendants will take possession of the strongholds of their enemies. Now, what is the enemies that the descendants of Abraham are taking possession of? Sin and death. Evil. In Christ. The promise is fulfilled in Christ. Reality is opened up to something much, much greater than our human experience tells us when it is just limited to the here and now. 
So the hope that then now is put in context. I hope that all good things will happen. Yes, absolutely. And this is good. And I should have that hope. It is a good hope to have. It's not a bad hope. We're all meant to have this hope. But that hope that is placed in the context of hoping him. I hope in God. And within that hope in God, I hope that the good things will happen that I'm praying for, say. But I hope fundamentally in God so that my hope is greater and other than expectation or anticipation. So that when things don't turn out as I hope that it will, I'm not crushed because my hope is in God. My hope is in God. Um, and, and to hope is to some extent to not know, as I said, if we to anticipate is a lack of hope. And, and to an anticipation leads very quickly into despair when things don't turn out as I want them to turn out. But hope is open-ended. Hope belongs to God. Hope is me trusting him. So it is never defeated when it is placed in God. As we see with the story of Abraham, it cannot be defeated even in the worst possible scenario. Hope desires God above all things. And all good things in God, the fact that we're going to get good things in God is good and we should look forward to them. Uh, but it's God first. We hope for them in God, in the context of God. And as God, God is our ultimate and greatest good. Nothing can extinguish our hope in God. And that, if you want, is the context that we need uh, to understand things like you know, martyrdom where those martyrs were, were just suffering with no expectation of anything except death, and yet with hope. And it's the kind of hope that we need when we constantly meet with disappointment, which is, you know, common. Because it's the hope that will keep us going, doing the good that we need to do here and now, the hope that we need to get out of bed, the hope that we need to make a difference. The hope that we need to change things, even when everything else in reality and everybody else included tells us, no, no, it's impossible to change these things. You can't change structures of sin. You can't change injustice. You can't change, you know, no, the, the hope in God is the hope of Abraham who saw miracles after miracles. The miracle first of miracle of having a son and the second miracle of being spared his son. And, and finding, you know, and having this angel come out of heaven. That's the hope that we have. That's the hope that we need to foster. A hope that is not limited by the reality such as it is presented to us, say, by the media, which don't take God into account at all in their presentation of reality. But that's, you know, a limited view of reality. And so I'm going to finish now uh, by um you know coming back to jesus the cross that can look like the end of all hopes and was for those who experienced it without any idea of the real resurrection the end of of their hope but then is opened up to the extraordinary event of the resurrection so that's where we're heading that's why this uh, lenten reflection will lead us to prepare for Easter, for the surprise, the, the wonder of the resurrection, which is the crown of hope, if you want, and, and the reason for our hope, which is God's entering uh, into our reality and transforming it so completely that now any suffering and death becomes um, becomes, you know, acceptable in perspective, as it were. I'm not sure if that's the right word. But anyway, I will uh, leave you there and also uh, invite you to join me next week. We will look at uh, Rahab uh, in the book of Joshua to Joshua. She's a, a fantastic figure of hope and we'll discover a bit more about hope with Rahab. Now, I want to finish with you and with a wonderful prayer by a, a saint who's a Jesuit, 
uh, Saint Claude de la Colombière, and it is act of hope. It's a little long, but I'm going to invite you to uh, pray it with me. Keep yourselves muted, but we can pray together. It's just the most beautiful prayer on hope. And after that, please join us in prayer by clicking the link that the sisters are putting in the chat box, which will lead you directly to our chapel with adoration. So I'm just going to pray that prayer and then send you off on the way. I'll, I'll end the meeting after that. My God, I believe most firmly that you watch over all who hope in you and that we can want for nothing when we rely upon you in all things. Therefore, I am resolved for the future to cast all my cares upon you. People may deprive me of my worldly goods and status. Sickness may take from me my strength and the means of serving you. I may even jeopardize our relationship by sin, but my trust shall never leave me. I will preserve it to the last moment of my life and the powers of hell shall seek in vain to grab it from me. Let others seek happiness in their wealth and in their talents. Let them trust in the purity of their lives, the severity of their mortifications, in the number of their good works, the enthusiasm of their prayers. As for me, my rock and my refuge, my confidence in you, fills me with hope. For you, my divine protector, alone have settled me in hope. This confidence can never be vain. No one who has hoped in God has ever been confounded. I am assured, therefore, of my eternal happiness, for I firmly hope in it and all my hope is in you. In you, O oh loving God, I have hoped. Let me never be confounded. I know too well that I am weak and changeable. I know the power of temptation against the strongest virtue. I have seen stars fall and foundations of my world crack. These things do not alarm me. While I hope in you, I am sheltered from all misfortune. And I am sure that my trust shall endure, for I rely upon you to sustain this unfailing hope. Finally, I know that my confidence cannot exceed your generosity, and that I shall never receive less than I have hoped for from you. Therefore, I hope that you will sustain me against my evil inclinations, that you will protect me against the deceitful attacks of the evil one, and that you will cause my weakness to triumph over every hostile force. I hope that you will never cease to love me and that I shall love you unceasingly. In you, O loving God, have I hoped. Let me never be confounded.